Now, wouldn't it be cool if you could sit down in front of a computer and after showing it the sorts of things that you liked, have it intelligently generate you unique works of art based on your own personal aesthetic preferences? I wanted to leverage the incredible power of modern evolutionary computing and artificial intelligence techniques to deliver a solution that would allow all composers, regardless of their level of technical ability, to create beautiful, original sounds. I wanted to build a system that achieved this by automatically learning and then modelling the musician's sound preferences, and then using machine learning and Darwinian techniques such as survival of the fittest to breed entire generations of beautiful sounds for immediate use in their productions. Now I worked pretty hard on this project for a year and I achieved uh, nowhere near what I expected I'd be able to when I started. Enabling a computer to understand sounds or indeed any sort of art is a really difficult problem and when you think about it, it's really obvious why. Computers have no idea what sounds good and what doesn't. They don't know the first thing about art. Today I want to show you why I'm so passionate about this technology and why I think that you should be too. Advancements to these technologies will not only result in improvements in the ways that we can interact with computers and vice versa, but it's also a very basic area of research, which will lead to vast improvements in a number of fields. So I've got three reasonably famous sound excerpts here. Have a listen to them. Now, did these sounds all have the same level of artistic beauty? Anyway, what's the difference between them? They're all just sounds, right? But I reckon that if I went round the room and asked everyone to evaluate them on their artistic merits, I reckon that everyone would come up with exactly the same evaluation. Clearly, one of those sounds is a masterpiece and a true work of art. One of them arguably has a small amount of artistic merit. <laughs> and the other's Kesha. <clears throat> But, but, but how, how did we actually come to that conclusion? How can we say that some sounds are better than others? Now, art's like porn. Everyone knows a masterpiece when they see it. Um, but the actual definition is really quite hard to pin down. Up until about the 17th century, people used the word art to refer to the mastery of any skill, including the sciences. Um, but now we tend to use it only to refer to the fine arts like painting and sculpture. So things that uh, appeal broadly to our very intellectual sense of aesthetic. Aesthetic is another term that's uh, quite difficult to pin down. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy defines aesthetic uh, as the study of sensory or sensory emotional values, sometimes called judgment of sentiment and taste. Now I believe that our uh, sense of aesthetic taste is completely personal, but it's based entirely in both the society and the culture that we live in. And this is why everyone broadly has a very similar sense of aesthetic taste. Now computers obviously can't work by themselves. Computers need a programmer to program them to perform tasks. Is this really very different to how the human brain works? We can't perform even the simplest of tasks, adding numbers, without receiving a similar type of training. So bearing that in mind, I think that it's really unfair to make a broad statement like computers can never possibly understand art because art is meaningless outside of culture. And we've constantly been bombarded with culture ever since we were born. All these pictures were created by a person with the aid of a computer. Even though they were created uh, using a computer, there's no way that we would uh, ever consider saying that the computer created the pictures in exactly the same way that we wouldn't say that Da Vinci's paintbrush created the Mona Lisa. So how is it possible for computers to actually create art in any meaningful sense? And how can we know when they have? I don't think that it's possible to create art without having access to an, uh, a, a large amount of existing artworks and a network of people to discuss the art with. And to create meaningful art, you really have to be able to understand and judge for yourself the aesthetic merit of the pieces that you've created. Now, computers can definitely store knowledge, um, and that's kind of the point of computers. But factual knowledge actually isn't useful on its own. Taking a look at these uh, chairs, all these pictures can be used to impart a kind of knowledge of uh, 
what a chair actually is. So we can see that chairs have a base, they have some supporting struts, a place to sit and maybe a backrest. Now even though we've never seen these pictures before, uh, we, can, we can tell that they're chairs because we understand what it means for something to be chair-like in a very abstract sense. And if I show you a similar picture of a chair that you've never seen before, it's going to be really obvious to you that it is indeed a chair. But give a computer that sort of knowledge and it's actually very difficult um, for the computer to figure out that that is a chair like the ones that it's seen before. So one of the key things that's uh, really necessary in a computer system that is designed to create art is that not only must the system have a knowledge of what art is and what it looks like, but it also has to be able to make broad generalisations based on things that it's already seen before so that it can judge things that it's never seen. Now in computer science, the subfield of artificial intelligence that deals with uh, how computers learn generalisable knowledge is called machine learning. <clears throat> now machine learning systems, in particular the two that I'm about to talk about, um, are really great for tackling these sorts of artistic problems because they don't actually require the programmer to tell the computer how it needs to solve the problem. Rather, the programmer says, go ahead and solve the problem, figure out how to do it by yourself, and if you need me, I'll be here to give you a hand. I think that the two key factors in the design and use of machine learning systems in the arts um, are the representation that's used so that we can interact on a meaningful level with the computer about the art that we're talking about, and also uh, the machine learning system's ability to generalise from things that it knows and things that it's seen before to new things that are similar to the things that it's seen but it's never actually seen. Now, the way we represent uh, the type of problem that we're trying to solve to the computer is really important because computers don't have an intuitive understanding of art at all. Take music, for example. We evaluate the artistic merit of music and sounds based on the way they make us feel and the emotions that they invoke in us. Obviously, computers can't feel, so we need to represent these things in a way that the computers can understand. Uh, so we have to take it from those very high level feelings, uh, down to the foundations of what sound and music really is. And the three core components of sound are uh, things called pitch, amplitude and timbre. Um, and taking measurements of all these uh, kind of tonal properties over a period of time allows us to have a more meaningful uh, interaction with the computer on the type of sounds that we're trying to show it. So using these representations lets us allow, uh, sorry, uh, using these representations um, allows us to inform the computer about a, a vast variety of sounds and musical forms. But we also need to give it an understanding of our culture and our sense of aesthetic. And this can be as simple as uh, just along with each sound, just providing it with, uh, just providing the computer with uh, a, a rating of how good the sound actually is, even on, just on a scale of one to 10. So now once the computer uh, has all this information, it is able to generate new sounds by itself. Uh, and all that's left is for the, for the computer to actually be able to understand what it's created and evaluate them on its own. And this is the hard part. Uh, I see two types of um, artificial intelligence to be particularly useful in solving these sorts of artistic problems. And they're things called artificial neural networks and genetic algorithms. Now, artificial neural networks um, are a type of connectionist artificial intelligence that work by mimicking the way that the human brain uh, learns and stores knowledge. In a neural net, a large layered series of neurons are connected together and a signal is passed through them. If a neuron receives enough impulses, then it in turn fires off a signal to all the neurons that it's connected to. Eventually, this signal reaches the end of the network and one or more of the output neurons are fired. And it's, it's uh, which of these output neurons are fired that allow us to know um, the solution to the problem that the computer has come up with. Now initially, when you create a neural network, it doesn't actually know anything and it has to be trained completely from scratch. The way we train neural networks is we take a, a, a large variety of sample problems that the network will be required to solve in, uh, when it's working in the real world. And we ask it to just basically guess at the solution to all these problems. Um, so obviously because the network doesn't actually know anything at the start, it's really just making a random guess for each one. Now, 
for each guess, if it gets it correct, then the network is rewarded. And this reward is just uh, a, a strengthening of the connections between the neurons that were used in coming up with the solution. Similarly, uh, the network's punishment, if it gets the answer wrong, is that these connections are weakened. And this is exactly the same way that, um, that uh, classic biological brains learn information. Um, and after this kind of trial and error training process, we expect that the neural network will eventually be able to be released into the real world and solve problems by itself based on things that it's seen in the past. And neural networks have been used uh, very successfully in artificial intelligence before to solve uh, real world problems. Now genetic algorithms are another very powerful type of uh, artificial intelligence and GA's work by basically mimicking the process of Darwinian evolution and natural selection. So firstly in a GA, all aspects of the problem and its possible solutions are encoded in a series of genes. Then breeding commences. A huge pool of possible solutions are generated by randomly stitching together a whole bunch of genes where each of these individual solutions uh, represents, based on the genes that it's composed of, a possible solution to the problem. Each of these possible solutions is then ranked and assigned a thing that we call a fitness score. And the fitness score is just basically a measure of how well each individual in the population actually solves the problem. Now sometimes calculating this fitness score is incredibly easy. Um, forget art for a moment and say that we were using a genetic algorithm um, just to construct the strongest possible bridge out of a limited amount of uh, materials. So in this case, um, the genes that we would use uh, in the representation of this problem uh, would be kind of factors that, factors that influence how strong the bridge is, such as uh, the, the location and the size of the struts, foundations, and the wires of the bridge. In this case, evaluating the fitness of each bridge is relatively easy. All you would need to do is use a piece of engineering software to uh, uh, kind of uh, make, make a model of each potential bridge and then ask the engineering software how much weight it could hold. So after we know which solution, well, which individuals in the population are the strong ones, then we breed them all together. So basically, the stronger solutions are bred with stronger solutions. And this is repeated time and time again for a number of generations. Um, we hope that after this kind of generation period has finished, we hope that because strong has been bred with strong consistently, um, we hope that the average fitness of the network, of the, uh, the, the gene pool, increases over time. And by the time evolution's finished, we hope that we have uh, kind of a whole species of extremely good solutions to the problem. Now obviously it's difficult to use genetic algorithms for uh, problems in the artistic domain uh, because artistic problems by definition don't have clear cut solutions. Uh, so by that I mean if you think that, well basically uh, where, whether or not you think that Beethoven is better than Kesha is a completely subjective um, kind of judgement that only you can make and there's no right or wrong answer. Um, and this is obviously going to cause a big problem um, when we try to evaluate the fitness of any of these solutions. So because the computer can't actually model this, then it really needs to ask a person to make a judgement. And my research is basically trying to simplify, automate and remove this step. And it's a relatively tricky one. <laughs> but researchers have been making great progress in this field for uh, quite a long time. Uh, artificial neural networks, for example, have been used in generating music since the late 80s. Um, so in the late 80s, P Peter Todd um, created a system that trained a neural network with a whole bunch of melodies that he composed. Some of them were good and some of them were bad. And then asked the network to try and learn things about the melodies that he created. And after he'd done that, after the network had gone through that learning process, it was able to spit out uh, completely new melodies that it had composed by itself. Um, since then, many more advanced systems have been created. And one of my favourites is a thing called GenJam. Now, GenJam is a system that can play jazz in real time, uh, in jam sessions with real uh, musicians. So not only can it create improvisations on the fly, it can do all this while responding instantaneously to changes in the way that the human performers are playing. So as well as this being very interesting uh, in a kind of academic artistic sense, it's also a really valuable teaching tool. 
Um, and we're actually starting to see quite a number of educational games released um, that use these sorts of techniques. So we've seen that art has no intrinsic value and that all value judgments are made by people based in the society and culture that they live in. I don't think that there's any reason that computers can't be taught to learn, appreciate and create their own beautiful works of art. After all, people are just complex biological computers. Now, advancements in this field will not only mean um, improvements in the way that computers and people can interact, um, but they'll also result in new techniques that can be used in a wide range of fields to solve really important problems. Um, so particularly in medicine, neural networks are used a lot uh, with great success in medicine. And this is a very basic uh, kind of research area in computer science. And I reckon the future is probably a lot closer than you think. Thanks. <laughs>